Got 20 seconds. Come on, Amanda, go. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Good. Get those knees up. Explode. Good. Explode. Let's go. Up. Rock four. Let's go. One more. Go. You are listening to the Fight Strength Podcast with your hosts, Phil DeRue and Jason Burgos. What is going on, everybody, and thanks for stopping by for episode 16 of the Fight Strength Podcast. Here, as always, is me, Jason Burgos, contributing editor for MMASucker.com, and my co-pilot for this weekly ride is the Jet Flying, Wheeling Dealing, hardest working man in the world of strength and conditioning. That would be American Top Team Strength and Conditioning Coach Guru, Phil (laughs) DeRue. Phil, what is going on this afternoon, man? Man, everything is good, man. But I don't know about jet flying. I'm not there yet. I'm not on that level just yet. <laughs> I mean, we're going commercial. That's still jet flying. Yeah. We, well, shit. I, I don't even think uh, JetBlue has, has first class anymore. So, oh. But we're all right. We're on the extended seats. So let's put it like that. We're on extended seats. We'll be all right. <laughs> I mean, so, so for our listeners who don't know, you did some traveling recently. You know, what brought you to Beantown, a.k.a. Boston, last weekend? Okay, so, yeah, we went to the Kabuki Strength Seminar out there. It's uh, Chris Duffin. He is a former world record holder at the 220 weight class squatter. I think he squatted somewhere around upwards in the 825 to 835, somewhere around there. And, uh, yeah, so dude's a beast. And uh, we went out there. I learned some proper bracing some intra abdominal pressurization techniques and just some corrective exercises. I've been following Chris's stuff for a while. Also, we got big announcement coming soon. I will not say it right now because it's still in the works, but just be on the lookout for that and uh, me working closely with the man himself. So, oh, very cool. we'll see what's up. So, it wasn't like um did you do any speaking there or it was a totally going to learn from other people and like some of the great nope. minds and industry thing? This time, it was me going to better myself and learning from a guy that's been doing this for a long time. Uh, It's a lot of dynamic neuromuscular uh, pressurization techniques and then also just being able to learn how to properly brace, you know, in the spine to withstand load. And uh, from a powerlifting perspective, it was a great way to learn how to actually lift efficiently and safely but also from a strength and conditioning standpoint I, I i implement this into my fighters training now and we're seeing big results with it just to be able to properly brace the spine getting that good pressurization making sure that we are being proximally stable by having distal mobility so that's that's one thing that i harp on a lot with these guys and as you know when you're creating torque and force and power you need to be strong in the midsection so this is one of the ways that we do that oh very cool i i mean so um this week our guest will be one of the busiest strength and conditioning coaches along with phil deru of course in mma for the last decade this is the well-traveled and talented jake bonacci however if you want to check out our previous episodes with some other top-notch strength and conditioning coaches like the likes of tony ricci dr Corey peacock PJ Nestler, Zach Evan Nash. I mean, there's a ton we've had so far. Great knowledge bombs dropped by those guys on those episodes. Then check out our pages on iTunes, iHeartRadio, uh, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, and search for us on YouTube. Now, also, I want to give a quick shout-out to Jay Aletto, the man in charge of PWPNation.com, for posting our episode with King Mo from this summer, and for letting me write a wrestling-based news piece on our interview with Colby Covington from, from uh, the show last week. Uh, we appreciate them getting the word out on the show. Def, go check out that website. It's a great source for pro wrestling and MMA-related news. Now, you know, it's, it's as a, a tradition every week on the show. It's the Ask Daru segment, which is sponsored by Daru Strong Training Systems. If you want to find ways to live stronger and live healthier like the high-level athletes fill trains every day that you need to learn more about this training system. Now, our question today comes from Dante Numai from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I hope I said that correct. His question mm-hmm. is, in your opinion, Phil, what is the best way to recover from a nagging injury? Yeah, so this is a this is kind of an iffy question, but it really just depends on the severity, the severity of the injury and the onset of the injury. 
always I always recommend, you know, getting with a qualified physical therapist to get you back into neutral and have you ready to work towards progressing in your goals as a whole. Now, after that, always make sure you're, con- you know, you're consciously aware of certain imbalances that may arise due to the injury and work towards improving those imbalances with proper corrective exercises. Now, recovery has a lot to do with the mental fortitude and the the psychology or the psychological aspect of overcoming the negative feelings brought on by that injury. You know, once you get hurt, obviously, you're you're more apt to thinking about that uh, that injury and more more so worrisome of what's going to happen if you mess up. So, getting that negative uh, connotation, negative thoughts out of your body, out of your mind, it will help you going further in your training now get that particular part of the body stronger we want to make sure that we're working working it with weight resistance to stabilize and mobilize and you'll begin to gain confidence after you get stronger pretty much so when we train on that particular part of the body that got injured this can you know obviously make sure that we are getting that mental mental fortitude back and work towards that but only if you're physically capable of doing so. So, I mean, it really just depends. And as far as, you know, a nagging injury, this basically is stating that it's something that can't be fixed or it hasn't been fixed yet. So this is the main thing we have to work on first. We cannot load dysfunction. So if we're having an injury per se, I would personally say get that injury fixed before you start to mm-hmm. go on any further. Mm-hmm. And you can work around that injury while you're trying to get that injury obviously better yeah i was just about to ask that i mean what you would you recommend you know for the non-professional athletes that are listening you know to to get and deal with the injury first but since you answered that how do you handle like how or more like how often do you mm-hmm. have to deal with nagging sure. injuries in your sure. profession and deal with so many fighters? I mean, like, would, how, how, what would you say the percentage is of the fighters that you train? Because this is such a physical sport and the training is mm-hmm. so physical. How many of them have nagging injuries all the time? Is it almost sure. 100%? I would say it's close to 90 to 95 percent. Yeah, especially with this high contact sport that we're in. If it's a non-contact injury, obviously, we want to make sure that we're getting uh, a clinician to look at that first and foremost and get them back to it as most at most 100 percent as possible. But from there, we have to work around that injury because obviously the things that we have to do have to go further. They're in camp. They're going to get hurt. They're going to get injured. Um accidents are going to happen bone bruises you know twist of the ankle uh knee tweaks things like that yeah we have to work around that quote-unquote nagging injury but like i said if it's something as severe Mm -hmm. as let's say an acl tear obviously we're not going to have to work on that we have to make sure we're getting that stable and ready to go Uh, we can work around it through other means of exercise and uh and strength and stability but from that perspective, you want to make sure that you're getting that fixed to go any, you know, to go further and to help your progression. Now, I mean, because you, you're working with, you've been doing this for such a long time. You've worked with a lot of different people. Um, you know, you don't have to give names, but uh, mm-hmm. have you ever had, what's like one of the more uh, difficult and peculiar injuries you've had to work around with a certain fighter and that it, in the end things still you know, ended successfully and they had a good showing in their fight. But what's one, one of the more difficult injuries you've had for a fighter to, to, to get through during a training camp? Well, there's a lot of different ones, but at the same, I'm not going to name any names or have, you know, even to say the origin of the, of the injury, but there's been times where, you know, I've had exercises or workouts written down and ready to go. And we have to auto-regulate that to fix the position of, of the injury and, and make sure that they're not hurting it anymore. So it's, it's a constant struggle. It's a constant battle. But as long as we are making sure that they are physically capable of moving as efficient as possible in, a, in their sports-specific demands, they can go out there and fight. Now, these guys are and girls are very – what's the word I'm looking for? They are, they're, they're able, let's just say they're able to, to work around their injury, Mm -hmm. you know, because they have had to do that for years and years and years way before me. Mm -hmm. So for me, I just, I'm just looking towards getting them stronger all the way around. If I can't physically help them through strength and what my scope of practice is, then I have to make sure that they're all of the other surrounding muscles 
are physically capable of movement in the most highest demands possible to, so that they can perform at the best of their ability at the best of their abilities for what they have going on so you know it's a it's a constant struggle but like i said is as long as you have systems in place and a method that you can work around any type of injury and do things to get the get the fighter ready for a fight in general and making sure that they can work around their injury through the proper movement patterns and good core stabilization, then uh, we'll be good to go. But I'm not saying that this is a, a, you know, something that we have to put on the back burner and never fix. Mm. I do believe that yeah. it is important to fix it. Uh, but if we have six weeks left in a camp or even four weeks left in a camp and you get hurt or there's a nagging injury there that we just really can't focus on right now, we got to focus on winning. Then, you know, at that at that time, if you're a true competitor, if this is your life and you're getting paid, I have to make sure that you're physically capable of getting in there and performing either way, if it's hurt or not, if you have an injury or not, we have to work around it. Now, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you have to deal with a lot of pre-existing stuff on guys. And um, we've had guests on the show talk about their, uh, like, a, the preparation, their report. You know, they have to, they go through an assessment with every fighter before a camp. And I'm sure it's to to search out those nagging things or anything, any injuries like that. What is your process? Because we've heard from our guests what their process is to assess their fighters. What is your process to assess in a fighter before they go into a camp? Well, there's standard procedures usually. Um, I usually use a, uh, a functional movement screen, but it's a mix between a functional movement screen and a sport-specific movement screen for a fighter's demands. So we'll run that first and also do a, a uh, um, injury history report and a questionnaire just to see you know what's been happening further along in their future, especially if they're a veteran and they've been fighting or you know, wrestling or something like that for a long time, there's going to be some type of injury and some type of dysfunction due to the, uh, the positions they're put on in their sport. And they just end up, you know, being so fixed and interiorly dominated because of the way their posture is in their fighting style. So, or in their wrestling style. So I make sure that we get that worked on first. And then every day is a standard assessment every day they come in i'm assessing their movements in their dynamic warm-ups in our warm-up in general and uh just trying to see exactly what's going on that day and further on in the future and also i can see you know from a from a uh from a sports specific perspective i watch them in their sparring and their grappling and if i if i see something going on as far as that they're not really turning their hips as much they're not moving as quick they feel a little lethargic or they're, or they're a little tired and that's that's an assessment that that I'm doing on the fly every day, and uh, and it's more sport specific in nature. So, yeah. So every day is an assessment like that, and then obviously it's going to be something of a I like to do you know from a from a general perspective an overhead squat, a inline lunge, a uh, hurdle step over, any solid FMS you know corresponding assessment that I usually do, and then we'll do something like a uh, a uh, um, a hurdle hop. Or a jump. If I had a jump mat, that's that's definitely what I would go to. Something like PJ did, um, that we were taught what that we talked about in his show, in episode fourteen, I believe. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So he did that, and then, you know, I'm also thinking about getting into more uh, velocity-based testing, which I'll talk more about that later on. Mm -hmm. But that's something that you can test out your true velocity through and in, in powerlifting they use it for bar speed and they can measure out what's going on if, if you're ready to go or if you're not ready to go depending upon how fast you're moving that bar for a fighter we can probably use that with a med ball toss or an explosive box jump or something like that to just see exactly what's going on are, are they are they firing on all cylinders that day and that's that's a daily assessment that's something that we do for for fatigue management so all right cool. hope that answers your question uh, I mean, I wanted to also, you know, thank Dante Numai for the question. And, you know, any for everybody listening, you know, remember, you can always send in Ask Daru questions anytime you want. Find us on Facebook uh, at Fight Strength Podcast and also on Twitter at Fight Strength underscore. Just send us your questions in. You can send us questions for Phil, for our, our guest, be it fighter or strength and conditioning coach. Please let us know what you think. We have an expert in the house every week. It is now time to bring on our guest. He's a Michigan native who has made strength and conditioning his business for over a decade. He's a three-time MMA Trainer of the Year nominee, 
who has worked with some of the best fighters in the sports history during his stint as a strength and conditioning coach at Extreme Couture and for a time recently at Black Zillions at the Jayco Training Center. And that man is Jake Bonacci. Jake, thanks for coming on the show with us this week. Thank you guys for having me. All right, brother. So, Jake, how did you actually get started in the field of strength and conditioning? And what made you start working with, you know, MMA fighters? Well, I figured out during my undergrad up in Wisconsin here that Mm -hmm. I wanted to do something with training, training related. And uh, I grew up a big, big boxing fan, actually, like being younger. And then later on, you know, start watching MMA Mm -hmm. and the UFC and everything. But when I went to graduate school, I got master's. And after that, I uh, had to do an internship or like a kind of a work assistantship. And at that time, Randy Couture was opening his gym in Las Vegas. And, you know, being a fan of the sport, I knew that that was going to be opening. And uh, I knew what day they were opening. And I didn't know anyone there, but I contacted them. And they, long story short, I mean, after a couple of months, they ended up, they said, okay, you know, you can come out here and, you know, basically train guys for free. And mm-hmm. we're not going to pay you. And, uh, you know, if you're willing to do that and, mop mats and do grunt work you're welcome to come type of deal and i was like perfect because Mm -hmm. i thought it was a i thought it was a golden opportunity you know to go out there and you know try to do a good job and Mm -hmm. hopefully turn something out of that opportunity and i was able to do that but yeah that that's really it got kind of lucky but (laughs) yeah it uh everything kind of fell into place Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were you were kind of one of the first to do this, you know, out of out, from a strength and conditioning standpoint for mixed martial arts, especially back then. I think that that's why, you know, it wasn't it wasn't worth any type of money because people didn't know what the worth was, and uh, right. and a lot of people were just doing circuit training and trying to get people to throw up and feel like <laughs> shit. But and yeah, you, you know what? I played into some of that too. Yeah, and, you know, and we, not, we all I have. I, did, I certainly didn't have all the answers, not even close, and I still don't. But if a lot of trial and error at that time. Cause like you're saying, it was so new. Like it, it just, uh, it was kind of like you really, it, it was a lot of trial and error. It really was. Cause there was no, there was no format out there to try to follow, you know? Yeah, for sure. So I recently, uh, spent time with your boy and it's my boy too, Corey Peacock. And, yeah. uh, well, we went and I took Dustin Poirier over to get a uh, VO2 testing, you know, uh, his body fat analysis, his bone density scanned, lactate threshold testing, explosive power, et cetera. Now, in your, in your opinion, uh, how do you feel about that? How do you feel? Is that important for a fighter to do before and after a camp? Uh, what's your take on that? I think if you have the means to do it, why not? You know, any, any data that you can collect and analyze and, try to improve upon if it's like a long-term athlete that you have. And that's the key thing. Like if it's a guy that you're going to have year round, I think it's a great thing. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, why not if you have the ability to do it and and really get an understanding of, you know, of the athlete and there's no better way to get a really good understanding than performing those tests. So yeah, yeah, I think it's a great thing, but can you do it without it? Sure. Cause I Mm -hmm. did it without it for, what six years so yeah yes. yeah it's 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 kind of it's, it's pretty new to me because just didn't have the uh the technology to do so or didn't have a person like Corey actually to be like hey man let me come use your uh your your whole laboratory setup you have over there i felt like i was in like the terminator movie or some shit <laughs> you know skynet? um that was i was i thought it was a skynet it was it was <laughs> kind of crazy um but yeah man it was cool and i think it gives <laughs> It gives it gives my guys kind of like a psychological advantage to see that statistical yes. data, you know. So yep. it, it's good to know because they're and, not just and, like, oh, the, I feel good. And then you know it's up to you to you know prescribe the proper training to to show the progress. Yes, exactly, exactly. And you can correlate that into your sport specific training. Like for me, I, I like to make sure that I I tell the guys why they're doing a, you know a certain type of movement because let's face it, man, they really don't want to be in there lifting weights or at least you know some of them do but um 
you know, they want to know what this is actually going to help them inside the cage and inside that octagon. And once you can, you know, relate that over to what they're doing for, to make money, you know, for their sport, they, their eyes light up. So I think that that's very important as well. Would you agree, Jake? I would. Yes. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Cool. It's a mental, it's a mental edge for them. For sure. Now, uh, you have worked with an amazing range of top-level fighters over the years, uh, two of them being Randy Couture and Anthony Johnson. Uh, from the period when Couture was a heavyweight contender to when Anthony Johnson's, to East Anthony Johnson's recent dominance, how much would you say the strength training industry has changed within MMA, and how have you yourself changed or evolved during that period as well? Well, I think... As far as the MMA industry, how the, how it's changed is that I think guys like Phil, guys like Corey, and guys like myself, we use our core movements, our squats, our push variations, our pull variations, and we're not really playing into all that sports-specific stuff that, including me, you yeah. know, did earlier on. Uh, we're getting back to everybody's kind of understanding, hey, these, the basics work, get them good, get these movement patterns good with these basic movements, get guys strong and condition them accordingly. So I think you're seeing a turn there. Because if you think back at like really like 07, 08, 09, even 10, mm-hmm. like there was so much garbage out. And I was part of that sometimes. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. You know, it was just trial and error, you know, back yeah. then too. You know, you see guys hooked up to all these resistance bands, punching bags during conditioning workouts, and like it was out of control. Uh, gas mask, gas mask on yeah. your face, and all this stuff, and it was really bad. But hey, you know what? That was a sport in its infancy, so yeah. it's not it's not a big deal. Everybody, I, I feel like the, the true professionals was in the field progressed properly and got through that, and now you you saw it. You're seeing it. These coaches now are minded like an NFL strength coach, you know, they're, they're going back. And like I said, they're taking these basic movements and getting guys good at them, getting them good and strong and conditioning them accordingly. And we're seeing, I, as far as like, you know, like you mentioned Corey earlier, you know, I worked with him down in Florida for a couple of years and our big thing, we're just trying to keep guys healthy. You know, that's okay. number one, mm-hmm. everything else on top of that, man, if you can accomplish other things, that's a bonus. But we were, we did a good job at keeping guys healthy. So they could show up and compete. But um, what was the other part of that question? I just I just hit the part where we're talking about how the fields progressed. I mean, and yourself, how you feel you've you've changed and evolved along with the the strength and conditioning industry within MMA. Yeah, a lot more injury prevention based. You know, throughout the years, my focus, my style of training has gotten a lot more injury prevention based, uh, rather than. You know, so hell bent on getting guys strong, getting guys in better shape, and you know, truth be told, they get plenty of conditioning on the mat every day. Exactly. And, you know, us trying to be heroes out there, you know, adding on to that, it's a real like, it's a real dangerous game because it's so easy to overcook these guys, and that's definitely what I was. You know, you know, I did that. You know, those first few years, I I, I, I was a somewhat of a negative asset as far as the condition goes. I think I helped overtrain guys. Wow. See, Jake, you know, this is why I get guys like you. <laughs> notice, notice, if everybody knows, like, I, I put on coaches on this show that I truly respect and that we see we are we have similar visions of what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Have you been looking at my IG recently? Because I just put up yeah. a post earlier today and, and you know what <laughs> i'm just gonna go ahead and say this man plug, i didn't plug. see it today. no offense i don't What's think i that? saw it today i don't think i okay. saw it today i don't know if maybe i did i don't know <laughs> all right well listen it, it, it's basically stating that we need to stop trying to be too sports specific especially in combat sports throwing punches with heavy ass dumbbells and weighted kicks and, you know, band-resisted, you know, throws on, on, a, on a heavy bag. Now, you know, I've seen it. I'm not going to say names. But we'll just leave it at that. I don't think it's, it's – I think it's suboptimal. Let's put it like that. Mm. Jason, that's all I have to say. Okay, all right. All right. So, so next, agree more. So next question. Um, 
you know, you you know, we worked with a lot of legends in the sport, like the guys I've mentioned before. But uh, you know, like Randy, the aforementioned Couture, Ray Seffo, Vitor Belfort. I mean, these are major, major names that have been around a long time. As guys that came from an era where it was even harder to make money in the sport with less sponsors, a lack of health plans. Do you notice in your long time in being in the sport? Do you notice a drive that is different in those men? compared to more modern fighters where coverage on major sports network and better money draws way more athletes to this to MMA than it did just 10 years ago were those guys cut from a different cloth than even the athletes today i think so a little bit um and i don't know if it's due to money or the other things that have come off the sport since but i i don't know like i i started like you said i started at randy with randy couture in his gym and i think uh the guys on that team, he attracted like-minded guys. So that mentality there was, we're going to outwork everybody. We're going to be mentally tough. And we will be showing up to fight no matter what. Look at all the guys you see pulling up from fights nowadays. Mm-hmm. Yep. That did not have, that wasn't like that before no. because those guys needed that check and they were going to fight, you know? And I think that's different, but I don't know if that was just that gym culture there too, which it might have been because, you know, the way Randy was, and I, I think that he, you know, he certainly had a trickle down effect, you know, with the rest of the guys. But uh, I will say during that time in Las Vegas, there was a lot less nonsense and a lot more work. Yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah. Well, it's it's an old school approach, man. And back then, those guys. It wasn't really about the money at that point, you know. It was more about really going out there and testing yourself. And let's face it, man, a lot of those guys had that old wrestling mentality in the background of you just got to grind and, and get things yep. done, you know. So yep. nowadays, I mean, it is more of a sport. We are getting – and that's a good and could be it, a bad it's thing. It's a good but... thing. It is, yeah. <laughs> so, it's, it's a good thing, It's like you said, and a bad thing. But it's good that it's progressing to the point where, you know what, guys don't have to – fight on three days notice anymore because sure, yeah. i mean i trained plenty of guys over the years that like john alessio for instance mm-hmm. hell he, he got a fight on a seven day notice i think it was to fight in japan and next thing you know we we're in japan he wasn't even training and yeah. he went and fought you know and it's yeah. just that mentality of those guys then was any time kind of thing you know yeah. <laughs> it wasn't and listen, listen I, I fought for no money i fought i had to come out of pocket to to fight at times I, my first pro fight I only fought for 200 bucks so and I was the main and I was the main event and it was against wow. a guy. Yeah, yeah, it was a guy named Kurt Hollibaugh who's in the UFC right now, and uh, wow. he's pretty good. So I mean, did you win? Was, no, I didn't win, and then I didn't even fucking win. You believe that shit? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, well, I, I, I lost. I'm, I, I'm in Louisiana, first of all, and I think DP was uh, Dustin Poirier was actually on that undercard. I'm not sure, but um. He thinks he was, but, you know, <laughs> I was there, and we had a, in the backwoods of Louisiana, wow. had to drive all the way the fuck out there in a minivan, and uh, I had to cut, it was my first weight cut to 155, and I cut weight in a Walmart parking lot, and then, <laughs> then uh, to put insult to injury, I lost a damn fight, uh-huh. and then only got paid $200, and I spent that on the way home, oh. so I mean, that's, that's how it goes, man. <laughs> But, but, um, but how many guys nowadays would be willing to do that? Yeah. No, that's that's why. Well, I hear these young kids now. Like we got young kids at the gym, good prospects, you know, that that really uh, that make me laugh because you know I work closely with Dean Thomas, and Dean Thomas is now one of the head coaches at that American Top Team. But he was my head coach coming up at his gym, at his satellite American Top Team up in uh, Port St. Lucie, and uh, you know it, it was at the point where like he wouldn't even sometimes he wouldn't even make the fight. You know, I'd be there by myself or like with another teammate where these kids are like kind of almost spoon fed. Like, or this is like, this is like easy shit for them, you know? And then they, they bitch about not getting paid. And I'm like, well, listen, yeah. man, you got to pay your dues, man. You're not even fucking six and oh yet. Like you, mm-hmm. you, you need to even, you need to at least get your feet wet and then you can start making big money, you know? Mm-hmm. But and, and it's the funny thing is that they're talking about like all oh, these high level athletes and and things like that, and we and and fighters need to get paid more. Well, like they need to get paid like NFL guys. Well, listen, man, if you really compared an NFL running back to a random 
just any day pro. And you can turn pro at any time, anywhere for MMA. It takes a long time, and it's and it's very it's a slim chance that you're going to make it to the NFL. Mm-hmm. So it's it's totally different. You know, these guys it's like a yeah. thirty percent chance. You know that you're making it to the NFL. It, I mean, the, the the chances of you making it to the NFL very slim to none. The chances of you being a, a mixed martial arts pro, eh, you can probably do it. So it's I still have that. hope. There's still a chance for me. You listen. <laughs> I can turn. I can turn you pro. It doesn't mean you're going to be good. Damn. But <laughs> you know. But what I'm saying is. MMA and and it's not at that level yet to where we we hold people accountable to be such at a, at a high level to become a pro. So I mean, once we True. do that, yeah. I think that people can make more money. But as of right now, we're not we're we're at that infancy level that you know, like I said, you don't even need to really have a. I, I turned pro after five amateur fights. I didn't even really. I had like a. I don't even think I had my blue belt in jujitsu yet. So. It's, that's that's how it is, man. You know, and I and, and it just so happens I lost by a fucking armbar in my uh, first fight. Uh, <laughs> oh, I wonder why. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, all right, Jake, we're gonna get back to get back to the question. <laughs> Sorry about that. A side track. Like, quick rant. My bad. Um, so <laughs> I know you talked about this in uh in you know previous podcasts that I've listened to, and uh, when you first get a fighter for your camp and uh, and, and he comes in, what is the first thing that you do to assess them? And, and do you have any type of any interviewing processes or history report, anything like that? I know you have your own thing. I think you had like your own assessment, but go ahead and yeah. go one further. I would do my own eva- my own evaluate. Well, talk to him first. You know, get get an idea of what what we're getting ourselves into. Kind of get to know him a little bit. Figure out. Ask. You know, obviously injuries number one. Mm-hmm. You know, if there are any injuries going on. What needs to be improved, you know, strengths, weaknesses, what needs to be improved upon, uh, prior experience, training is a big one, you know, what have they been doing, that matters, you know, as far as program design, what you can really throw on right away, uh, then, you know, do the, do the assessment and address limitations first, you know, address, you know, any type of limitations and figure out what correctives you want to use within your programming and uh, hit the ground running, you know, yep. usually... I always say after the first block of training, that's when I know someone, you know, yeah. that first three to four weeks. And then I, you know, I have a pretty good idea of what I'm working with, but that's pretty much it. I mean, I don't make it over to complicated, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that's a solid issue. A lot of the times is people try to make things over complicated, get too tech savvy and try to do so many different things where we can really just assess a person by watching their movement, you know? So sure. easy. Yeah, but, yeah, so, you know, and I'm not, I'm not going to bag on the tech stuff. I think it's great. It's mm-hmm. great, like all the monitoring devices and all that that stuff is great. Mm-hmm. But if you don't have it, you know what? You're going to make it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it has its place, um, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, make it solely a part of your whole program and that you have to depend upon it. Right. Um, so okay. So you so in your opinion, what are the things that you're seeing? That are that people are doing wrong in the combat performance world, and and how do you think that we can go about fixing it? I think that there's not as great of emphasis on injury prevention, oh. and I think that we have too many injuries due to a lack of monitoring of volume and intensity of training overall across the board, and, and I'm including all the coaches in on that and. You know, I, I understand there's so many different, you know, dimensions of mixed martial arts. You know, you have all your specialty coaches and, you know, we're a piece of that pie, obviously. But at the end of the day, we're the ones that should be carrying the knowledge. And as far as, you know, administering proper volume and intensities throughout yeah. the week of training and, you know, and throughout a training camp for the peaking process. Mm. And I think that is often a pretty big miss. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why you're seeing all these guys pulling out and getting hurt and everything else. Mm-hmm. But so I think that I always say, if, I think the the best thing I've ever brought to either team that I've worked on was monitoring, you know, overall volume and intensity. That's mm-hmm. always step one. And thankfully, especially in Florida, you know, I was working with Henry Hooved and Greg Jones, and you know, we. Um, we were really good at that, you know, yeah. being in communication, being like, Hey, so-and-so smoked today. 
Well, guess what? As a strength coach, you better modify what you're going to do so you don't continue pounding the nail into the ground, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, you mentioned in an interview how having all the specialized coaches for a fighter under one roof is uh, hugely advantageous uh, compared to that not being the case years ago, even at Extreme Couture when you were there. Uh, back then, how much time did you get with your fighters? And if you get much more time now, how much of a difference has it made for them to all of their, to, you know, to have all their coaches in one place? And, you know, do you have any examples of that kind of a situation? Yeah, like in Vegas early on, a lot of guys bounced around, you know, different places for jiu-jitsu, different places for, you know, whatever, striking. They worked with a boxing coach elsewhere. And then they basically would only come to, you know, uh, couture's for strength and conditioning and, you know, pro team practice. And that was hard, like, for me because – a lot of the guys use different coaches. So I was trying to always know, Hey, what, you know, what the hell are you doing every day? And how, you know, and be in, and be in touch with those other coaches. Well, how hard you push them, you know, give me a 10 scale here. What, what was it today? Yeah. You know? So, and then when, you know, when I was laying, you would lay out the weekly training logs and get it to the, you know, the other coaches, I would try to put like a, like an intensity on there for each session. Like, let's not, like, let's not smoke him in this session because he's going to be sparring later today. Simple stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Simple things that go a long way. Mm-hmm. But, uh, so that was kind of a pain in the ass, honestly. <laughs> but, um, be, coming to Florida, it was it was really nice because we were all there every single day, you know? And it, it was more like a professional team setting where I could, you know, I see Henry. I see what he's doing with so-and-so on the mitts today. I can see how hard sparring was today. So I know, like, I know how I need to either pick it up or pull back the next day, that night, whatever it may be. And that, that stuff, that that's priceless. And, you know, Phil, you know that, like being a yeah. top team, you know, sure. that being in there and seeing it with your own eyes, like some of these other coaches that don't step in there and actually see what the hell an MMA practice looks like and how intense a wrestling day is. How yeah. in the hell can you gauge <laughs> the rest of the week after that? Unless you're right. sitting there watching and experience it. Mm-hmm. You can't, right? Yeah, definitely, I mean, definitely. Now you hit it right, man. It's, I mean, a lot of the times is that we're, we're, we are constantly making sure that I'm talking with each individual coach. And, and don't get me wrong, the skills coaches are trying to make them work hard and push them as, as much as possible, especially from a sports-specific perspective. But, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not really trying to outdo another coach, you know. And that's right. and that's something that these other strength coaches or, or just coaches in general need to stop doing is trying to be – above everybody else and really work cohesive with the whole entire coaching staff for that particular athlete fighter. And once right. we can develop that more so, and, and it's more of an ego thing than anything, I, I believe. And uh, once, once we can actually get rid of that notion and, and we can really get these fighters to uh, one, obviously we want to make sure that we are, you know, managing that fatigue and two, keeping them safe. Like you always, that like, we harp on, which is very good. Um. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the hero, the hero comments are right thing. That that's a sure. that's a good way to you know look at it because we have so many, there's so many dimensions. There's usually a handful of coaches involved. If everybody's trying to save the day, you know mm-hmm. you're going to burn that guy out. Yes. So step back. And there was many times, you know, Corey and I would talk and be like, "Look, they got pounded this morning in wrestling." Yeah. It, we need to we need to back off, you know. And those little things go a long way. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, I've talked with Phil about how sometimes fires can be difficult to handle, and and a former guest on ours, uh, Tony Ricci, is working on his doctorate doctorate in uh, sports psychology, so he could further help the psyche of his fighters. You know, how how much of your work with your athletes is as much trying to motivate them to understand the value of your programs? Well, like I said earlier, I always say I know the guy after three or four weeks. And I think that kind of, once I figure out how they tick, I know how to be, I know how to be with them. I know what buttons to push. You know, I, I know the things to say, you know, you kind of, as a coach, you need to be a chameleon and you need, you can't treat everybody the same because everybody's different. You know, each athlete's different. You know, the way I motivate one guy may not work one bit for another guy. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, yeah. this sport, it's such an individualized sport that there's not a whole heck of a lot of, you know, you know, raw, raw stuff coming mm-hmm. for me. Like these guys are, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're driven. It's all on them. You know, they don't have, you know, 10 other guys like, you know, in the NFL, the 
back them up on a day they don't feel like being there. So mm-hmm. fortunately in this sport, I've never, you know, I really haven't had to be that cheerleader type of coach. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because, you know, a lot of them are like, you know, I get interviewed a couple of times and like, how do you motivate your guys? And I'm like, man, if they're not fucking motivated to get in there and what they do, you know, they close the cage door. And if you're not motivated, you're going to get your ass whooped. So they're pretty motivated to begin with. You know, these they're yeah. not high school football kids or anything like that. They, they're, they're pretty highly driven. Uh, the, the key for me is almost sometimes I have to actually pull them back and actually let them realize that what we're doing here is to help them further along in their career. And we don't always have to push it to that next level or, or get them feeling like they're going to pass out or die or something like that. Uh, with that being said, too, you also have to make sure that you are enhancing the ability to uh, the art of coaching. And there's there's a science behind the art of coaching and learning what your fighters, you know, ticks are and how they how they you know communicate and what they want to do and how they can how they can work towards getting goals accomplished. And uh, that's that's something that does come with with years of experience in coaching, not just like something you can read in a fucking book. So. Right. With that, that's that's definitely application of how you actually you know interact with your fighter, and, and it's fighting because you know athletes athletes are similar, but fighters are on a different level. They think a little bit different just because they are solely alone, and they a lot of them don't come from a sporting background. A lot of them come from being bullied in school, or you know they they, or they come from like you know having just a solid martial arts background where they're where they're highly dedicated to their their art so it's not something that uh that comes really natural for somebody to actually depend upon another teammate and that's where we see a big altercation is where you know one guy wants to be selfish and not help his teammate out where at the end of the day if you guys don't help each other out you're not going to get better so that you know, I have to relay that to them from that perspective. Not so much as a as a motivational guy or somebody who's got to who's got to hype them up or be that rah rah guy like like you know like Jake was saying. But it, it's more so of getting them to realize and buy into the program and to buy into a team that's going to help an individualized sport. If that makes sense. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. All right. So. Let's just get into it. Now, Jake, what's your take on HRV, velocity-based testing, and any forms of fatigue man- management devices? Now, I know that you you are constantly, we're always assessing our guys, seeing you know what they're doing on that day and things like that. But do you use any technology to actually help you with that process, or is it all just like word of mouth and kind of looking at how these guys are, are performing? Well, over the years, I mean, the majority of it's just using my eyes. Yeah. You know, over the years. And, you know, I use a heart rate monitor quite a bit. Um, we were using that Omega Wave down in Florida mm-hmm. with some of the top guys. Yeah. And all you all, all are useful tools. But, you know what? 90% of the guys that I work with couldn't afford that Omega Wave. Yeah. You, exactly. know, you know, buying that for themselves. So we use the heart rate quite a bit. and. You know, I, I would look at recovery times and things like that, and seeing how they were recovering, and get and basing a lot of that, a lot of, uh, you know, that that was my kind of my gauge. Yeah, you know, for if sure. we're not dropping X amount in some minutes, it's pretty in a minute. It's pretty easy for me to tell if you're a little fatigued or not. But uh, overall, gosh, we had such a good setup down there in Florida. I thought, mm-hmm. especially towards the end there, before the black zillions kind of uh, went away. I guess they're still going now. I don't. I don't know what's going on with that. But uh, good um, contact club and stuff. But you know, it's not. Yeah, but the, when we, when we had like all the coaches under one roof, we had that. We had a pretty good, pretty good system down there where guys were firing all cylinders at all times. Sure. And, yeah. Um, but again, I'm not. I'm, I'm for the technology. It's great if you can have it and use it. If you don't have it, you better have a good coach that can keep an eye on you and have good vis- visual inspection okay so for all all the coaches out there see if you are broke you're good to go <laughs> right to <laughs> that's go. right Listen, we, we've been doing it for years all right that's right now like i said if you have the abilities to, to get that heart rate variability monitor go ahead and do it but you can always test the grip strength and test their where the heart rate is in the morning and go from that's there right. and, and also coordination when they're training if the coordination's off you know obviously uh, well 
somewhat you, you may you may have some overtraining uh tendencies but for most part let's uh let's keep it as simple as possible if you don't have no money <laughs> yep well uh, Jake, uh, since you know you mentioned that you're you know you're not with the Black Saints anymore, and, I, and we we asked Corey Peacock a similar question. Um, like, what at what point did you kind of realize yourself that it was time to go, and you made the decision to leave to where you are now? And, and did you ever like notice like the the drama that led to whatever version of Black Saints is left and it dissolving? Uh well, I think that. <laughs> there was a shortage of money and uh uh you know it, it was just a bad scene overall towards the end and which it's just unfortunate because we had a lot of we had some good things going on there but it, it was time to go for me i was there for four years and a little See, over four now, years. look jake you could have just you could have just called me and we could, I would, I would have had a place for you at American yeah, Top Team. Yeah, you <laughs> go. See? That would have stirred uh, up some drama, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. It was just time, and that that happens though with most, a lot of these teams. You know, you kind of have your hot time for a couple of years, and things kind of, you know, fizzle out. But so that's, I guess, how I'll sum up that experience. And I think it was time for some people to just move on. Did it give you like a sour taste on the experience, considering how high Black Zillions was at a certain point, and how much success they were having, that it went so south so quickly? That do you still appreciate the time there, or you're kind of sour? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sour about it at all. No, I, it was a great opportunity. I met a lot of cool people and had fun working with a lot of different guys. I, n- nothing negative about that for me. It was it was just time to roll. <laughs> All right, so, so that's pretty much all our questions now. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to plug in terms of social media for the people that ha- aren't following you yet, like an Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, your your website, jakebonacci.com, any of those things you want to let people know who are listening? Yeah, Instagram is uh, jake underscore bonacci, same as Twitter. I don't update it too much, but I'm not – I got to get on that a little more. But, yeah, I don't know. I put content up every once in a while. Uh, Phil, you let let them know your usual uh, sources, please. Yeah, so I, I get a lot of questions now on Twitter, so I'll go ahead and uh, I'll, I'll harp the Twitter is the Roof Strong. My Instagram is the Roof Strong. You can DM me there if you have any questions, and also if you want to email me, it's Phil at theroofstrong dot com. And also check out that newsletter every week. You can go on and subscribe uh, on my website, theroofstrong dot com. Everything's pretty much very simple. So get on that. All right, and and don't forget to look up the. The the, the the web the sources for our show fight strength podcast like I mentioned before on Facebook uh, fight strength underscore on Twitter the show is on iTunes iHeartRadio SoundCloud YouTube and Google Play Music thank you so much Jake Bonacci for coming on we really appreciate it yep, thank thanks you. for having me guys all right and that is our show I am Jason Burgos he is Phil DeRue Phil say bye bye peace. <laughs>